Good morning, everyone. It's another beautiful, sunshiny day. So great to be here. Great to be here with each one of you. And uh, I hope that as we go through this worship service today, that you you can take something from it that uh, will be meaningful and that will help you throughout the week. We're going to talk again today about one of the miracles that Jesus performed and then see how we may learn from it and apply that in our lives today. So think about those miracles that Jesus performed as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning and listen to our prelude. Responsive reading this morning is from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, 
who could stand. But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Please stand as you are able as we sing our hymn number 2088 in the black hymnal, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my death to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to see How are you, Alex? Good. You eating chips this morning? Well, that's a heck of a breakfast. <laughs> Did you already have breakfast? <laughs> you know what? We've got a couple of eggs to look at this today. You have one? Mm-hmm. Open, open, open it up. Let's see what's in it. Can you open it? Oh, what is that? A screw? screw? Well, I think it's a nail. A nail? Yeah, it's a nail. Do you know what a nail reminds us of? Yeah. Hold on. Let me. What do you think the nail is? Remember, we're in Easter and we're think we're talking about Jesus. This nail reminds us that they nailed him to the cross. Oh. Yeah. What it nail looks like is, uh, would you... So, we... Like a building and you add nails. Yeah, you use nails for buildings too. So let's put that one back in here. <clears throat> and then... What's that? What is that? You tell me, it's a cross. What does the cross remind us of? Jesus' death, Jesus being sacrificed for us. Yeah. Yeah. So this, Alex, you see, <laughs> Alex is gone. So we, we, we're reminded today that they nailed Jesus to the cross, and then the cross reminds us that he sacrificed himself for us. Oh, okay. did Why did he have to sacrifice himself for us? Uh... I don't know. Let me think. Let me ask this a different way. Are you perfect all the time? No. Okay. No. <laughs> Neither am I. So that's why he had to to sacrifice himself because we're not perfect people. Yeah, I would. I would go get a drink. You had to go get a drink. Yeah. yeah. I can imagine all that uh, running around and ah! salty chips probably. Um, Cause you to be thirsty. <laughs> so remember today we're, we're talking about Jesus 
being nailed to the cross and his sacrifice for us because we're not perfect. Okay? You ready to go to the nursery? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You head to the nursery. You head back to your seat. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning is from Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were many, there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, Suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh come upon them, and skin that covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Walk, walk, walk them bones, walk them bones. Walk, walk, walk them bones, walk them bones. Walk them, walk them, walk them bones, walk them Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. The little wheel run by faith, and the big wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel in a wheel, way in the middle of the air. Round and round and round and round, round, round and round. To the football, the football's connected to the ankle ball, the ankle ball's connected to the leg ball, the leg ball's connected to the knee ball, the knee ball's connected to the thigh ball, the thigh ball's connected to the hip ball, the hip ball's connected to the back ball, the back ball's connected to the shoulder ball, the shoulder ball's connected to the neck ball, the neck ball's connected to the Head ball, hear the word of the Lord. Bones, ten bones, gonna walk around, ten bones, ten bones, gonna walk around, ten bones, ten bones, gonna walk around. Now hear the word of the Lord. Bones, ten bones, gonna walk around, ten bones, ten bones, gonna walk around, ten bones, ten bones, gonna walk around. Now hear the word of the Lord. Bones, ten bones. Bones, ten 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 bones, ten
If you would turn your hymnals to page 13. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave, up, or gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ given for you.
We're now given an opportunity to give back a portion in which God has blessed us. And as we just sang in that hymn, may we allow the Spirit to guide us in how we give back, and may we give back with joyous hearts. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your rich blessings. We thank you for being in our lives, for providing us hope, providing us salvation. And Lord, we ask that you would bless this offering that we give back to you, to be used by you, by your church. And we ask that it may be used in a way to expand your church, expand your kingdom here on this earth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel from John chapter 11 verses 1 through 16 and 23 through 27. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is our God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. 
Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to there to waken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe that, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. A familiar story. We've heard this before. We know of <clears throat> we know of Lazarus dying. We know the story of Martha and Mary coming to Jesus and both of them, in effect, saying, look, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. But as I've said the last couple of weeks, Jesus does nothing on accident. <clears throat> Jesus purposely waited two more days after he got the news that Lazarus was sick. Perhaps Lazarus was actually already dead by the time the news got to Jesus, and Jesus knew this. But notice that when he arrives, Martha and Mary come running, both first Martha, then she gets Mary, Mary comes running. They take him to the tomb, he wants to be at the tomb. And when he tells them to remove the stone to allow Lazarus to come out, there's an objection. Lord, he's been, a, been a dead and he's been in the tomb for four days. He's going to stink. He's starting to rot. But Jesus says, remove the stone and let him come out. And he comes out. And again, we've heard the sermons, I'm sure, Bible studies that talk about Martha and Mary's faith. We've heard the ones that talk about how awesome, and we remember the, the awesomeness of Christ raising someone from the dead. And then I would venture to say none of us have seen that actually happen. So we're amazed by that. And that's all good. But I pose this question. What did Lazarus do after he was raised from the dead? Think about this. What did Lazarus do? Now we're not told exactly in this story, but we are told elsewhere that Lazarus ended up having dinner with Jesus, and, and we're, we're told that he continues to follow Jesus. And I ask you this question. Did Lazarus dwell on the sickness and the struggles in his last breath before he died? Or did he rejoice in the fact he had new life? I submit to you a, a, a possibility and one that I believe is more likely to be true is that Lazarus rejoiced in new life. He didn't go back and dwell on the sickness. He didn't go back and dwell on the struggles of taking that last breath before he died. I submit that he rejoiced in new life. Renewed life, a life that Christ gave him. And this is this is an example of how we also 
can rejoice and live in a new life. Christ has given each one of us a new life. Oh yeah, I'm sure we all have histories that include some bad things. Maybe some bad things we've done. Maybe bad things other people have done to us. We have a history that shows some brokenness. But we can decide to take on that new life and accept that new life that Jesus has given us and live in a new life and not dwell on that past. Not that we should ever forget it. We should learn from it. But move forward in that new life and, and rejoice in it. And here's the thing. We can do that individually. But we also need to do that as a church. Universally, the universal church has had bad history. Think about it. The whole Crusades is a nightmare to many of us. If we go back and read through them and what happened in the Crusades. Within our own nation, we've had a history that is not good where our churches first supported slavery and then ultimately opposed slavery and so we've been on both sides of that fence as churches. Even locally, every single local church has something in its past that has not gone well. And there's been something bad that's happened. But here's the question for the church, much like it is for us as individuals. Are we going to live in that past and allow that to define us? Or are we going to allow Christ to define us and live in the joy and the renewed life that he's given us? I can promise you this, if we live in the past that is bad, or as far as that is good, we can live and talk about the good old days and talk about the good times that happened 30, 40 years ago. But they're not today. Each day is a new day, and each day is a new opportunity, and Christ has risen us to go forward each and every day. We need to live in the present and in the new life that Christ has given us. And why did he give us new life? Christ gave us new life to be in mission. You see, one of the faults that the church particularly in, the, in America has done over the last 30, 40 years is they've stalled we, we as a church, we as a national church across our entire nation, regardless of denomination, have stalled, stopped, gotten lazy, and lived based off of what had happened years and years before that. We stopped being in mission. We started focusing solely on those within the walls and not focusing outside them. Christ said, go be in mission every single day. He sent his apostles to go be in mission. They sent people to go be in mission. That's how the gospel got spread across the world. That's how it continues to be spread today. But I'm not talking about us sending missionaries to Africa. Quite frankly, we don't need to send missionaries to Africa because the church there is growing in abundance. It's doing quite well. So well that Africa is sending missionaries here to the U.S. Because we are faltering and failing and not in mission ourselves. Christ put us here and renewed our life to be in mission. And we don't have to go halfway around the world to be in mission. We can be in mission to our neighbor, to the person down the street, to our neighborhoods, to the, our community. And quite honestly, if we're not in mission in our community, and if we're not reaching out to people, and if we're not professing the gospel of Jesus to our community, out, those outside these four walls then we're going to continue to see the trend that we've seen, seen for the last several years, and even more so, it seems, in the last few years, of churches closing, of them dying off. We like to blame the fact that, well, our young folks went off to college, and college taught them some liberal 
out there left field kind of thing that doesn't have anything to do with church. Or we like to blame, well, you know, people work 24 hours a day, seven days a week now. Businesses are open around the clock and people have to work. And we like to blame it on that. Or we like to blame it on, well, you know, COVID happened and people got used to sitting at home and watching church in their pajamas. But here's the thing. All of that is a bunch of hogwash. The ultimate fact is this. We are not in mission. We have not been in mission. We are afraid to tell our neighbor about Jesus. Fear is the real, real cause. Fear is the cause. And why are we afraid? We're afraid that culture is going to laugh at us. We're afraid someone that we look up to will laugh at us because we believe in Jesus and we want to talk about him. But that is a false fear. That's Satan lying to you. Because Christ gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of strength, of courage, and of wisdom that we can go speak. And if we think we don't know enough to talk about Jesus, we're wrong. We know who he is. We know that he lived, we know he taught, we know he went to the cross, we know he rose again on the third day, and we know what he's done in our lives and how our lives have been for the better. So we know what to say. We can talk to people about him. If they ask some deep theological question that you don't know how to answer, that's okay to say, I don't know. But we can go do some research and find out. But the basics, you know all of them, and quite frankly, you all know a whole lot more than you think you know. You don't give yourself enough credit. You know a lot that you don't think you know. We need to be in mission. Christ put us in mission. He renewed our life, just like he lit, brought Lazarus up from the grave, and he renewed his life, gave him a new life. He's given us a new life. So are we going to go live in that life in joy, as I am suspecting Lazarus did? Or are we going to dwell on the past and dwell on the bad and say that's what defines us? We have a choice to make. Christ wants us to go in mission. He wants us to follow him in that mission. But following means getting dirty. It means the dust of his feet come up on us. It means that we walk in those same footsteps. It takes a lot of work. And it takes every one of us. Each and every one of us need to be in mission. Despite what some have come to believe over the last several years. And I'm not talking about just here. I'm talking about across our entire nation. They think one person can save their church. They can say that one person can save a particular group of people and keep them going. One person can have an impact, but... One person can't do it by themselves. It takes all of us. It takes every single person to be energized and every single person being in mission. So that's a challenge for all of us. Not just today, not just tomorrow, not just this week. But every week, every day for the rest of our lives telling people about Jesus. If you would, bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this example of Lazarus and, and Jesus raising him from the dead. An example that shows us that you have conquered death and that we don't have to live in a past that's filled with illness and sickness or a bad history. We can live in a new life, a joyous life that is given by your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen.
would bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we again give you thanks for giving us this beautiful day. Be with us and guide us. Fill us with your spirit as we go throughout this day and this week. Lord, we ask that you guide us as we go into mission. And Lord, we have many different people on our hearts and minds, and specifically we lift up Susie and Riley and Josie, and Doris, and Sandy, Lord, we know that you know their situations, the illnesses, the diseases, the struggles. You know what they're dealing with, and we ask that you be with them, that you give them strength, give them courage, that you bring about healing as needed, and God, we ask that you bless each and every one of them. Lord, we ask that you work through the leaders of our nation, that you bless them, that you guide them, and that you direct them according to your plan. And Lord, be with our brothers and sisters around this world. Continue to give them strength and courage to speak about your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, especially be with those who are being persecuted for their faith. Give them the strength to continue to testify about your son and make their message effective, that it may reach their persecutors and bring them into your kingdom as well. Lord, we're thankful for your, the example of your son, Jesus, for him coming to this earth to be our perfect example, to be our teacher, and to show us that you have overcome death and that we should rejoice in this new life that he has given us and that we need to be about teaching others and telling others about the this, this saving grace that comes through your Son and the joy of a hope and salvation that you have promised. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. As you go this week, may each of you go to go in mission, to tell others about Jesus, and may you believe that he will give you the strength you need to do so. Amen couple of quick announcements. Um, this evening we are uh, to serve at Horizons. It's our week once again, our Sunday once again to serve there. Uh, so if you uh, need help, then, although I'm getting some confused looks. <laughs> Maybe, anyway, Horizons can always use help serving in Sunday evenings. There's a, uh, they always have on, on uh, Sunday evenings a meal, and it's served by churches. And so go and um, help them out if you are, are able. Also, uh, we will have breakfast this morning, as some of you may be able to smell uh, the, the, the uh, fragrant aromas coming from that direction. So stay and, and enjoy fellowship in uh, uh the Jensen Hall for our breakfast. And then a quick reminder too, if you have not reached out to me yet, if you've been thinking about it and you're still thinking about it, that's fine. But if you would like to place membership here on Easter Sunday, let me know uh, sometime between now and, and next Sunday so that we can prepare everything uh, for you to do so. With that, may each of you go in peace. Thank you.